Okay, three announcements. No Bible class Thursday night. I had scheduled Wayne House, but he had surgery two weeks ago, and he still needs to recover. And I hope that if you get a chance, you can go see The Ark in the Darkness, which is about a new documentary on Noah's Ark, and Randy Price is one of the uh, key speakers in the film. And then on Sunday, April the 7th, we're going to celebrate our 20th anniversary. I can't believe that. My health time flies when you're having fun. So it'll be interesting to see how, how many people show up who were here at the beginning, back in the days of, what was it, White Oak Baptist Church. So we've got about four here, I think, that were at White Oak. So that goes back a ways. So that was our start. How shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Jesus prayed to the Father, sanctify them by means of truth. Thy word is truth. So before we get started, we're going to make sure we're in right relationship with the Lord, which means we're going to have a few moments of silent prayer to make sure that we are in right relationship with the Lord and confessing sin in silent prayer if necessary, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Our Father, it's a great privilege we have just to gather together in freedom to study your word, to reflect upon your goodness and your grace and how you have worked things together through history, bringing about various uh, events in history to bring a lead to the fullness of time when Christ came, born of a virgin, and ever since. And you're working together the issues in history in history and contemporary events today, uh, setting the stage for what we believe will be the end times. And so, Father, we know that uh, that may be around the corner, it may be down the street and around the corner, and it may be a little longer than that, but we look forward with anticipation to our Lord's return. So, Father, as we continue to be steadfast in your word, we pray that you'd help us to Put the details together as we continue in our study in this interlocked curriculum, and we pray this in Christ's name, amen. All right, tonight we're moving from the first part of Lesson 13, which started with uh, an understanding of the Mosaic Law, the covenant God made with Noah, I mean with Moses, and let me see if I can get this started, I can't talk and get... There we go. Okay, got that screen going. So on, on Mount Sinai, what happens when God gives the law? It's not just the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are a sort of a prelude, like the prelude to our Constitution. And they establish the underlying principles of the law. And as Jesus summarizes the law, he says that we are to love the Lord your God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we saw that last time. That's the first four commandments. And then love our neighbor as ourself. That's the rest of them. And so what the 603 other commandments are in the Mosaic law are related to explaining examples of how loving your neighbor is played out in terms of civil law and in terms of the ritual law uh, that God is establishing in the Mosaic Covenant. So this, this evening we're going to look at, um, we stopped talking when we were talking about Shabbat or Sabbath and then sacrifice, what's the sacrifice for the covenant and then the nature of the law. I've kind of summarized the last part of this lesson that way. And so we've gone through our basic timeline. I'm not going to review it tonight. And we've gone through the creation, fall, flood, Tower of Babel, call of Abraham, 
uh, the Exodus event, and now that the Exodus event has occurred, which is a picture of salvation, it's a picture of the redemption of the nation, and now the law is given after after the redemption of the nation, the law is given to show how a redeemed people should live. And it's a picture of the fact that the law is not the basis of their salvation, of their redemption. It is given afterward, just as the commandments in the scripture are given to us for obedience uh, after we are saved. And it's very important to understand that there's a lot of Christians who go around trying to impose Christian, uh, specifically Christian morality that is knowable only by revelation on unbelievers. And 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that the natural man, which is a term for the unbeliever, cannot understand the things of the Spirit of God because they are spiritually discerned. And so we're trying to impose a code of conduct that is for believers on unbelievers who can't understand it. And unfortunately, there's a lot of believers who don't understand it, and I'm using the term hopefully because they think that that has something to do with their salvation. Uh, So much confusion that is out there. So last time we went through the fact that, number one, God declares Israel as his son. And so Israel is God's son in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, Christ is the Son of God who comes to the earth. And there's a correlation here because you see both Israel and the Lord Jesus Christ are referred to as God's Son. Both spend 40, uh, the number 40 is significant because the Israelites are 40 years in the wilderness. Christ is 40 days in the in the wilderness and uh, during the temp- during the temptation, both are led by the Spirit. So there's a lot of parallels that go on there. So Israel is adopted as God's son. So everything after this is really to understand the family relationship that is that the law represents. Most people don't think of the Mosaic law, and that's one of the key themes in the way they've developed this, which I think is very important to bring out that um, if you think fast forward into the New Testament, this isn't, this isn't a quiz unless you can come up with it off the, uh, off the top of your head, uh, but the, the Greek word for dispensation that is translated dispensation or administration is the Greek word oikonomos. It's a compound word. Oikos means house. Namos means law house law. And what it is saying is that in each period of history that God has set set apart for different purposes, there's a house law. God is the uh, picture, is the creator, and so he has certain rules for humanity to live by. Unfortunately, a lot of people in our generation are against rules and against the law. They ignore and make up law out of whole cloth in the judicial system and ig- ignore things and don't even understand anything. We have a Supreme Court justice who just this last week said that the First Amendment just really gets in the way of government doing what it wants to do. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. That's exactly why it's there. You know, and there's all these other people who come along and say, well, all these rules in Congress, it it makes it difficult to do anything. Yeah, that's the purpose. It's supposed to be difficult to pass laws and to change laws and to do things. So um, that's so people like you won't just start imposing all of their crazy, idiotic ideas on everybody else. And um, uh, so there's house law. And house law in the church age, we often say, is based on grace. Well, guess what? Same thing's true with the, the Mosaic law. It's, it's based on grace. So we're going to see this. And too often, we tend to look at the Mosaic law through the lens of the Pharisees' opposition to Jesus based on their abuse of the law. Okay, and I'll talk about that when, when we get there. So the law is given in order to teach a people who have been slaves that don't have any real capacity for freedom or or personal responsibility for all the details of their life to teach them what it means 
to live in a nation that is set apart to the service of God and what that, what that is supposed to look like. And so we looked at that last time, looked at the Mosaic Covenant, the parties involved, uh, God on the one hand and the nation Israel on the other hand. This is really the birth of the nation Israel. And now the, what we didn't get to were the last four lines. The signatories, that's the ones, the ones who sign or the sign of the covenant, we, we look back on the Noahic Covenant. The sign of the Noahic Covenant was what? The rainbow. Then you had the Abrahamic Covenant. The sign of the Abrahamic Covenant was what? Circumcision. And now you have the Mosaic Covenant. And the sign of the Mosaic Covenant is what? Sabbath. So we will look at that. And then the uh, founding sacrifice, which we... Uh, looked at in a little bit in the previous um, covenants, the type of the covenant or contract, and then the reason God gave the Israelites for obeying the law. Now, those four we didn't get to last time, so they're at the top of the, what we're going to do today, and then look at the idea that God's law is personal. How did Israel respond to the covenant? Uh, the witnesses, the prosecuting attorneys, and a reminder that Exodus comes before Sinai, salvation comes before uh, the relationship. And so the law defines how this relationship on the part of the Is Israelites should be conducted. So the signatories, those who sign the document, and God signs a document, and the signature is his Sabbath. Exodus 31, 12 and 13 the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you through our, your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. Now, this is uh, very important to understand this, because in ancient Near East, they had a certain, category, uh, certain types of covenants, our are treaties that were made between a king, like a ruler of an empire, and uh, subject nations. And the technical for, term for this is a suzerain-vassal treaty form. And a suzerain is just a, the great king, like the king of an empire, Caesar, or maybe a, a Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonians conquered people, uh, Alexander the Great conquered a number of pe people and uh, subjugated them. And so when a king would subjugate a people and they were serving him, there were certain ways in which they would establish the legal, uh, the legal basis for that relationship. And so they had these covenants had, or contracts or treaties had certain forms. Just like if, you were, if you're in real estate, if you were to look, somebody were to just hand you a real estate contract and if you had been in the business for 40 or 50 years, you could look at it and say, oh, that's the way it was done back in the 70s, or that's the way it was done in the 60s, because each decade or so, there are going to be different modifications and changes, and so you can identify that. Well, in the mid part of the second millennium BC, around 1400, 1500 BC, the dominant view, uh, the dominant contract form was called this type of suzerain vassal treaty form. And, and God uh, has uh, condescended and adapted to this human structure so that it would be comprehensible uh, to the, the um, uh, Israelites. And so it's basically a form of what you will do, what you won't do, what's allowable, what's not allowable, and right in the middle of it as the Sabbath commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor, do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. It's the Lord's Sabbath. It was Later on what happens is the Pharisees take this and th th come up with this theology that the that Israel was created for the Sabbath. And so they add all of these additional rules and regulations onto the Sabbath that are not there. Uh, the, the model is, uh, in verse 11, in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Now that's a real anthropomorphism because God doesn't, or anthropopathism, God doesn't need to rest. 
And the idea is that God worked, he, as a, he's pictured as a laborer, as a creator, as a craftsman, and then he rests. But God doesn't rest. God doesn't stop being actively involved over his creation. He's doing something else. And so the idea is that whatever you're doing from Sunday to Friday in order to put bread on the table, you do something else on Shabbat. Maybe you play games or you get involved with athletics. It's real funny because I remember one time Pastor Theme went to, uh, went to Chicago. He used to do a conference up there, and this was back in the 80s, and had lunch with uh, Dr. Gleason Archer, who taught at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And Dr. Archer is a well-known Old Testament scholar and has written a number of fine books. But Dr. Archer, uh, they started talking about the, the Sabbath, and, and he said, oh, I, I, I keep the Sabbath every week. And so, you know, in the certain cr Christian traditions, they shifted this and started calling Sunday the Sabbath. And, and he made the comment, he said, but, but every now and then I, I've got to watch football. And I thought, others than the obvious absurdities of Sunday being the Sabbath, that's the idea. You, you know, you go from in your job, you go from Monday to Saturday, and you're working, you're studying, you're writing, you're teaching. And so what you do on the Sabbath is you do something else. It's not saying be inactive. It's not saying sleep all day. It, be active in some other way that is a break from your normal six-day routine. And this is the way that the Sabbath was, was meant to be. But that was totally distorted by the Pharisees. So in, the, in the, this illustration they have, you have the initial opening four commands related to God. Then there's, you'd have the terms of the treaty, and in the middle of it, the dynasty seal, and then the terms of the treaty. And what you have in the, in the, um, uh, in the Ten Commandments is the Sabbath is the fourth command. You have three commands related to God, then the Sabbath, and then the other relate to uh, how you relate to your, your parents, your neighbor, and others. And on the seventh day, it's the Sabbath rest. And it doesn't mean that you necessarily rest, but you do other things. You work in some other way. You enjoy God's creation. And this was uh, the, original, the original principle. And so we looked at that. What's interesting when we look at this is that we have a seven-day week. Now, I did a little bit of research on this. So when we talk about a year, how do we measure a year? A year is measured by how long it takes the Earth to go around the sun. It takes 365 and a quarter days. And so every... Four years, you have leap year, you have to make up uh, that day. And how do we know a month? This gets really interesting. How do we know what a month is? That's based on the lunar cycle. It's based on the moon. And so the moon goes around the Earth every 28 to 29 and a half days depending on how you're counting it. Uh, and I've got, I, I'll address that in, in just a minute, but that, that leads to some real, real, real confusion. Um, some say, let me see here, from, on a NASA website, it states, the moon displays these eight phases, one after the other, as it moves through its cycle each month. It takes about 27.3 days for the moon to orbit the earth. However, because of how sunlight hits the moon, it takes about 29 and a half days to go from one new moon to the next new moon. And that seems confusing. I guess that's why some, some things you look at, they say the cycle's 28 days for a lunar month, and others will say it's 29 days, and even some say it's 30 days. No wonder we're all confused. We don't know what time it is, so we just insert daylight savings time. <laughs> Who knew that time needed to be saved? Jesus died for us, not for time. So we get this seven-day seven day week, and um, 
it doesn't necessarily divide into anything unless you're thinking that the lunar cycle is 28 days. Then you have seven days divided into it, four days, but then at the every now and then you have to insert what they do in the ancient world is they would insert another month in order to play catch up. We have leap year where we insert another day. Uh, but if you di didn't do that and you're on a lunar cycle, which the uh, Israelite calendar is based on, then eventually you would be celebrating your spring festivals in the fall and your fall festivals in the spring. So they would have to uh, add something. And so uh, there have even been books that have been written on this whole issue of why do we have a seven-day um, work week. There's one man who wrote a book called The Seven-Day Circle, The History and Meaning of the Week. And the basic conclusion is all the moon's fault because it's not that reliable. One, one writer on one website says, this, the, the week's slender hold on linear time accounting hasn't gone unnoticed. Throughout history into the 28th, into the 20th century, thinkers have tried to oust the seven-day week for various philosophical mathematical and political reasons, and yet the damn thing persists. We don't really know where the seven-day week originated. I read, about, read my way through about eight or nine articles, and they all ignored that no one mentioned the Bible, not one. That, that this comes from the creation week in the Bible, none. They, and they would attribute the seven-day week to Babylon, not to the Hebrews. So it's a lot of speculation out there. And he says, we don't know where this seven-day week originated, but there are some existing theories about why a period of around that link would make sense. And then he quotes someone, only by establishing a weekly cycle of an unvarying standard length could society guarantee that the continuing of its life would never be interrupted by natural phenomena such as the lunar cycle. I mean, it just gets pretty weird. But other... Various cultures in the uh, Tang Dynasty in China and in the Indian Golden Age, they had a 10-day uh, cycle. Um, one article suggests that ancient China, Egypt had 10-day cycles. Some African tribes had four-day cycles. The Mayans had 13 and 20-day cycles. The Etruscans, who were the predecessors of the Romans, had an eight-day week, but then they moved it to a seven-day week. It's interesting how... People tend to move toward, no matter what they've done, 10-day, 12-day, whatever. Uh, the, the Russian, Soviet, the Soviets experimented with a 10-day week. After the French Revolution, in, interesting, after revolutions, you try to change the calendar. But uh, after the 10-day, uh, rev, uh, uh, after the Soviet Revolution, they went to 10-day work week, but it just didn't work. It seems that eventually cultures tend to move toward a seven-day work week, but nobody seems to explain why. You know, there's an astrophysical reason for uh, the year, for the month, but not for a seven-day work week. But we get that figured out. And then some are trying to make it a three-day work week and four days of, of getting in trouble because an idle hand is the devil's, idle mind is the devil's workshop, as they say. So that's interesting. God is the one who established the seven-day cycle with his, his creation. So that brings us to the founding sacrifice. And in Scripture, God and man cannot come together because of sin unless there is this, this founding sacrifice. God is righteous, and he cannot enter into a contract or a relationship with his creatures unless the sin problem is dealt with, even if it's only a temporary basis, which is what the Old Testament sacrifices uh, were. And, and um, the idea that man cannot enter into a contract with God is not something unusual. We have laws in most uh, cultures in Western European countries that prohibit minors from entering into contracts, uh, prohibiting uh, people with certain uh, mental deficiencies from entering into contracts, uh, things of that nature. And so before man can enter into a contract with God, he has to take care of, uh, God takes care of the sin problem. And so it's only when there is a, a sacrifice, an innocent sacrifice, 
of a like a lamb without spot or blemish that takes the place of the of the human then man can be declared righteous by God and enter into a contract with God. And so we come to a basic look at these sacrifices. We have the Noahic covenant or the New World Covenant as they put it. And the initiating sacrifice was when Noah got off the ark. Then he took uh, seven uh, of the clean animals and sacrificed them. And this is described in Genesis 8, 20 to 22, as they came off the ark. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and there he sacrificed as burnt offerings the animals and birds that had been approved for that purpose. So we know there had to have been some sort of revelation to God, by, from God to Noah what were clean animals, what were unclean animals, even though that's not recorded in Scripture. And the Lord was pleased with the aroma of the sacrifice and said to himself, I will never again curse the ground because of the human race, even though everything they think or imagine is bent toward evil from childhood. I will never again destroy all living things. As long as the earth remains, there will be planting and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, which they didn't have before the flood. They didn't have that cycle of the seasons because of the way the earth's atmosphere was prior to that. So then we have the Abrahamic covenant, and Abraham sacrificed a heifer, a goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. And they were, this is the picture here, as they are cut in half, and then uh, as they're laid out, there would have been just a lot of blood from the sacrifices, and then uh, God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Abraham, so that he slept through the whole thing and God passed through in the form of a smoking torch uh, to symbolize that he alone was binding himself to the contract and um, that it was not based on any condition uh, placed upon Abraham. So we come to Exodus chapter uh, 24 and there we see that... Um, the Mosaic Covenant is, is based upon sacrifices. Exodus 24, 4, Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose early in the morning, and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and 12 pillars. These are standing stones. Um, they find these standing stones in lots of different sites in the ancient world, especially around temples or sacred sites. 12 uh, uh, standing stones according to the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young men of the children of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half the blood and put it in basins. Now when you look at these animals, they will, there will be gallons of blood. And when you look at the number of the sacrifices, there would be uh, all of these different animals. They would have to have uh, quite a few of these large basins that, uh, for uh, carrying the blood. And then he took half the blood and he sprinkled it on the altar. So it is a picture of sanctifying uh, the altar, that it is cleansed uh, so that it can be used in worship. And then verse 7 says, Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people, and notice the, their response. They said, this is great. We're going to do it. We'll do everything just like the Lord says in their enthusiasm, and we will be obedient. That didn't last long. That was an emotional response. Verse 8, Moses took the blood, and now he sprinkled it on the people. So he had this, this hyssop, like, it's a, kind of a sponge type thing, and he just... He's going and they're just sprinkling the blood on the people. And it's, um, it is a very graphic and visual way of demonstrating that uh, people have to be covered, set apart through the death of a sacrifice. And all of that is, of course, picturing the fact that we are uh, covered by the death of Christ on the cross. So when we look at these covenants or contracts of the ancient world, 
We ha- we've looked at three now, the Noahic Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant, and the Mosaic Covenant. And in the Noahic Covenant, I'll just read down each column. The contract is God on the one hand, and he makes the contract with ma- all of mankind, represented by the only eight survivors, and all of the animals. He promises no future global floods. He will not destroy the earth by water again. Uh, The sign is God alone. He places the rainbow in the sky. The founding sacrifice is described in Genesis 8, 20 to 22. And the type of covenant, it's an unconditional and permanent covenant. The Abrahamic covenant is also an unconditional and permanent covenant. It is between God as party of the first part and Abraham and his descendants, a party of the second part. The promises are, uh, are land, descendants, and worldwide blessing. And these are unconditional and everlasting promises. Nothing uh, can, can uh, break that covenant. God alone signed it at, with the a- sacrifice of the animals, it's described in Genesis 15, 9 through 11, and it's unconditional and permanent. But the Mosaic Covenant is a temporary covenant, and it's conditioned. I prefer the word temporary as opposed to conditional, because they all had some conditions in one way or another. But the Mosaic Covenant was designed to be temporary. That's really how the writer of Hebrews expresses it in Hebrews chapter 8. So it's between God as party of the first part and the 12 tribes of Israel, the sons of Jacob, as the party of the second part. There are blessings for obeying the laws and cursings for disobeying the law. And if you disobey the laws, God's going to take them through five stages, increasingly more, uh, more disastrous stages of judgment on the nation, with the most severe being the fifth cycle or the fifth stage where he's going to take, uh, remove them from the land that he promised. The land is still theirs, but they can't enjoy it, and it will not benefit them because of their disobedience to God. So he, that's the, the nature of the discipline. Uh, it's de- described in Exodus 24, 4 through 8, and it is a, t- a temporary covenant. So the reason that God gave the Israelites for obeying the law is gratitude. You you obey the law because you're grateful to God because of what he has done. You you don't obey the law so that you'd have eternal life. You obey the law because you're grateful for what God has done. And because of what God has done, you have this wonderful land. And if you obey God, the land is going to be productive and fruitful and you're going to be prosperous. And if you don't, then you're going to... Uh, go through various stages of loss and, uh, and pain and economic disaster and uh, many other things. So in Deuteronomy 4.37 to 40, we read, And because he loved your fathers, I want you to notice as we go through this how much the motivation for God giving the law is his love and the Um, and that the Israelites are to reciprocate that in obedience. Obedience is because they love the Lord. It's a family dynamic. It's the house law. And in, in a good, healthy home where you have two parents and you have children and the parents understand their roles and responsibilities according to Scripture, then they're going to establish rules not to... Uh, because they are trying to keep the kids from having a good time and, and having fun, but because they know that it's best for their protection and to provide for them and so that they can learn uh, self-discipline and grow up to be uh, productive uh, members of society and have a thriving spiritual life. So we read here, because he loved your fathers, Therefore, he chose their descendants after them. Notice, it doesn't say because he loved the Israelite people and saw their wonderful faith. It says, no, he, he loved your fathers. 
Therefore he chose their descendants after them and brought you out of Egypt and his presence with his mighty power, driving out before you nations greater and mightier than you, to bring you in to give you their land for an inheritance as it is this day. Now God's just not taking the land away from him, but because these people have uh, rejected God and they have uh, given themselves over to such terrible, terrible sin that was so destructive and malignant for the human race that God has to basically, like a surgeon, cut out the cancer of their paganism. And so as a result, he's going to give this land as a possession uh, to the Israelites, descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and then Moses says, Know therefore today and lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other. Therefore you shall keep his statutes and his commandments, which I command you today, that it may go well with you and with your children after you, and that you may prolong your days that the Lord your God is giving you. So what we see is first God saves them, redeems them, brings them out of slavery, and then he gives them the law, which is a picture of how they are to live. So the motivation is that you are to live this way in gratitude to God for the fact that he brought you out of slavery. And this is how grateful uh, children should respond to their, uh, their parents. There's a model there. And then in this next chart, it emphasizes the fact that God's law, God's law is personal. God's law is very personal. Typically, we have the understanding of law because of the way we relate to law in our culture, that we relate to law as a as a list of simply do's and don'ts, as some sort of impersonal code of rules. And that if you don't do the right thing, you break the law, then there's going to be punishment. And um, the scope is external only, so that something a policeman or lawyer can observe, that they see you breaking the law. They don't know what's going on inside your head, what your mental attitude is. And the reason we obey the law is to obey, uh, uh, avoid punishment. But in God's law, it's different. It, God personally addresses them and puts an emphasis on their heart attitude, which no other human being can truly understand or see. And so we'll see this emphasis in the verses that we look at. And so the scope is to be an internal heart attitude and external behavior and the motivation and the reason to obey is gratitude so god gave them the law to teach them how a son should relate to a father and to others it's not just some cold impersonal law code now there are some people and i had a man a fairly good bible student one time tell me that the law was was really bad and I said, how can you say that? Well, look at the Pharisees. They were, they were terrible. I, and I said, you don't understand it. The, the law that they were emphasizing was the oral law, which for them superseded the written law of Moses. And they had added all sorts of rules and regulations so, uh, that, on top of what God said. And that was why it was so bad. It wasn't because the law of Moses was bad, because Scripture specifically states in Romans seven twelve that therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good because it comes from God. It's God's standard. There was never a more perfect law code in all of human history. And part of it was to show that how you would love your neighbor. So you have a law such as the one in Exodus 22.1, if a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, and he's caught, he shall restore it, six, um, uh, he shall restore five oxen for one ox and four sheep for one sheep. So there's restitution. I find it interesting there's not incarceration 
you either have restitution or the death penalty. Very simple. That's a great model to have. And then you don't have all, we spend billions of dollars on an outmoded system of incarceration and we ought to just go to those two penalties. Number one, you pay it all back, tenfold, twentyfold, whatever, or you die. Very simple. So Deuteronomy 10, 12, and following, and now Israel. Uh, so th look at the e emphasis here is on the heart attitude. It's not on external obedience. This, Jesus makes this comment in Luke 11 about the d Pharisees. He says they clean the outside of the cup, but, it, but the inside of the cup is dirty. In other words, they have external obedience and no internal heart attitude. So in verse 12, and now Israel... What does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today, for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. And verse 15, the Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them. Now, the Hebrew word for delighted there is a word that means it's a more intimate form of love. It's to be attached to someone. And so the Lord was attached to your fathers to love them. And he chose descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is this day. Therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart. It's a heart it matter not just external, and be stiff-necked no longer. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality, no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Now, what kind of a law code is this? You know, read the Constitution. It doesn't say anything about loving God or loving one another. It doesn't say anything about having the right heart attitude. It doesn't say anything about inner, inner thoughts. Um, but God's law in, has encouragement, care. It has uh, per, uh, nurturing persuasions. It's reassuring, giving advice. It's like the letter from a father to a son. And verse 20, you shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. He is your praise. He is your God. He's done for you these great and awesome things that your eyes have seen. So you have all this language here that you have fear the Lord, love him, serve him with all your heart and soul, it's for your own good. Change your hearts. Stop being stiff-necked and stubborn. And because God shows love to foreigners, so you should love foreigners also. So there's, there's the difference. And so it's, a very, it's not this sort of a legalistic list of do's and don'ts that's superficial. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, we see that God looks on the heart which man cannot do. Uh, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance, because he's looking at David. Don't look at his appearance or at his physical stature because I have refused him. He's looking at Eliab, who is David's older brother, looks like he ought to be king. They made that mistake with Saul. It says, for the Lord does not see as a man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So the heart is an emphasis for the Lord. But it's designed to teach something as well. In Isaiah 29, 13, uh, the Lord says, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths, superficial mouth lip service, and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men. And so God is teaching that it should be a hard attitude, but were they successful? No. So he's teaching something about the heart. Now as we go through the material, it um, goes to an illustration from the Pharisees. 
And the Pharisees had taken uh, God's law and they had changed it. Instead of God's intent that this should be your heart attitude and there should be a transformation of the inner man, not just the outer man, the Pharisees re- took out the heart attitude, had a substituted a checklist, and that was the basis for their understanding uh, of righteousness. And so we see this situation in Mark chapter 3, which is representative of uh, ep- an ep- parallel episodes in Matthew 12, 9 to 14, and Luke 6, 6 to 11. Now, with Matthew 12, you ought to click on this in your mind and say, well, that's the chapter where there's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and the Pharisees accuse Jesus of casting out demons on the basis of, of the power of Beelzebul. So this is towards a turning point in his, in his ministry. And there's this challenge that takes place because he heals a man on the, on, on the Sabbath. And so we read here, he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. And so they're watching him. They're, they're, it's almost like they they're, they're want him to do something so that they can, uh, it's an aha moment and we can um, condemn you for what you're about to do. Uh, Luke uh, is very specific, saying that it's his right hand that's withered. And he's, um, the, the, the scribes are wondering, the Pharisees are watching to see what Jesus is going to do. They wanted to accuse him. And so uh, he then says to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save the life or to kill it? And so he's reminding them that even in their Pharisaic law, that if a sheep has fallen into a pit on the Sabbath day, they'll pull the sheep out of the pit. And he uses this form, a style of argumentation. Uh, we would call it an ad hoc, uh, uh, um, a fortiori argument from strength, that if you're going to save the life of a, of a sheep, you might as, you're certainly going to save the life of a human being or heal a human being. Uh, isn't a human being's life more important than that of a sheep? And so he heals the man. He says to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save a life or kill it? Now he's, he's put them on a spot, so they keep silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, uh, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to them, uh, said to the man, stretch out your hand, and the man stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. And then we learned that, that this was a combination plot. The Pharisees hated the Herodians. The Herodians were, in, were, were the bureaucrats. They were aligned with the family of Herod, and they weren't spiritual at all. Pharisees and Herodians had nothing in common except for their hatred of Jesus. And so uh, that, that's the point there. So what God is saying is a good heart leads to good behavior, and God is pleased. But a wicked heart does what? leads to uh, superficial good behavior, but God is not pleased. But Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And then ask the question, who can know it? Verse 10 answers the question. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. What's interesting is if you look through the structure of Jeremiah, the word deceit or deceitful occurs nine times. Six of them occur before verse nine. Then you have, that's the seventh one, and there's two more after that. There are, Jeremiah is indicting the people, and six prior times he accuses them of being deceitful uh, with God. And so uh, now he is showing God is the one who searches your heart. You haven't fooled God. He knows your deceit. So that brings us then to uh, the next point, which has to do with how did the Israelites respond to the covenant? 
And they responded to the covenant with, you bet, we're going to do this. We'll promise to do everything. And so Moses read the entire book of the covenant to the Israelites. Always read the contract before you sign on to it. So they just were all filled with emotion. Now, in the contract, there were three witnesses in the ceremony. The first witness was the law itself. The second is the song that is written for their national anthem, as it were. And then the third is heaven and earth. We'll look at each one of these. So it was in Deuteronomy 31, 24 to 26. So it was when Moses had completed writing the words of, the, of this law in a book when they were finished that Moses commanded the Levites who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord saying, take this book of the law Put it aside, put it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there as a witness against you. So what did God mean by that? That the law, the Mosaic law would be a witness against them. And it was that they would, whenever they would violate it, the law would be there to condemn them. And so in this illustration, you have a Torah scroll that has all of the law code. And you would say, well, you broke this law and you broke that law and you broke this other law. And so the law itself would stand as a witness. If the law was kept, then it was a witness for the people. But if the law was broken, then it was a witness against them. So the law was one witness that condemned them. The second one is the song. And so this is really interesting in Deuteronomy 39. God reveals a song to Moses, and God is speaking here, and he says, therefore, and he's addressing Moses, he says, write this down, uh, write this song for yourselves, and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. When I brought them to the land flowing with milk and honey, of which I swore to their fathers, and they have eaten and filled themselves and grown fat, then they will turn to other gods and serve them. So there's a prophecy here as well. They're going to go in when they hit, hit prosperity. They're going to lose and fail the prosperity test. And they're going to turn to, to these other gods and serve them. And they will provoke me and break my covenant. Then it shall be when many evils and troubles have come upon them, that this song will testify against them, so their national anthem condemns them. For it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants. For I know the inclination of their behavior today, even before I have brought them to the land. So God already knew their heart was deceitful and wicked, and they were going to fail. And so Moses wrote the song. God wrote it. Moses wrote it down. And it stands as a testimony against the people. And then we have, I don't know how that got up out of the way in the wrong place, the two witnesses. And now you have heaven and earth. And heaven and earth is, uh, uh, when it talks about uh, calling upon heaven and earth, it's talking about those who inhabit the heavens. So who inhabits the heavens? Look up here. The angels inhabit the heavens. Who inhabits the earth? Human beings inhabit the earth. So that's what he's saying. He said, we got two categories of God's creatures, sentient beings. We got the angels on the one hand and humanity on the other hand, and they're going to be the two witnesses that condemn uh, Israel. So he says to uh, Moses, gather to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers that I may speak these words in their hearing and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I, and verse 29, for I know that after my death you will become utterly corrupt and turn aside, this is Moses speaking, you will uh, become utterly corrupt and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you and evil will befall you in the latter days because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. We've read the book of Judges and they did. That was exactly what happened. And then in 32.1, Give ear, O heavens, and I will speak, and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. So the law is the contract. It gives the standard for righteousness. 
and the people are going to fail and it will stand as a witness against them. The song is a prophetic testimony of what they will do in the future when they disobey God. And he called upon the heavens and the earth as a third party witness, the angels and humanity the, as witnesses against Israel for how they would uh, disobey the law. The result, uh, the contract was supposed to be read aloud every seven years to all the people so the Israelites would know for sure that they had not kept the law. The song prophesied what would happen, and that was a testimony because that's what happened. And then the people, uh, looking at how the Israelites behaved, could tell the people and the angels would look at how the Israelites behaved and could tell that they broke God's law. They saw that Israel failed. So in any court case, what do you have? Well, you've got a prosecuting attorney for the government. It's God's government. So God has his prosecuting attorneys, and they're called the prophets. They represent God. Uh, in Isaiah 1, 2, and 1, 3, notice, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. They're calling upon the witnesses. Isaiah is calling upon the witnesses just as Moses did. For the Lord has spoken, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows its owner, and the donkey knows its master's crib. But Israel does not know my people do not consider. They're dumber than a donkey and dumber than an ox. So we come to start to the last part of the lesson, which is a reminder that redemption comes before relationship. And so first there's the Exodus, and then there's Mount Sinai. After, only after the people are saved does God then give the Israelites the standards for how they should live. So the law comes after the Exodus, after, uh, after God saved them, after salvation, then God tells them how to live. And that is the way it should be for us. I think there are a lot of times when we are uh, surrounded today with more overt uh, situations and pure paganism that I heard of an episode today where um, a a Christian had received an invitation to a same-sex wedding and was discussing the reason she wouldn't go with an unbeliever. Now, the problem with that is an unbeliever doesn't have a frame of reference to understanding your decision-making. It comes across as callous or comes across as uncaring without understanding uh, the issues. But the, per the, per the unbeliever uh, mentioned this to someone in the congregation who was able to give her the gospel. So we'll see how that goes. So we have to be careful. There are, there are things that go on even in law that, are, that some Christians say, well, such and such ought to be a law. But the only reason you know that such and such is wrong is because of your, the authority of Scripture, in your opinion. But it's not knowable other than from Scripture. So that's not wise to make it a law. So what happens first is Israel's exodus. Yahweh called upon the people to trust him. He saved them and showed them grace. And then after he delivered them, then he gave them uh, a law code on how they should live in order to be a people that, say, that serve him. So it is the p same picture of salvation. We don't start talking to people. If someone comes up to me and says, well, if, if I were to become a Christian, then would I have to give all this stuff up? And I say, no. You know, somebody may say, well, if I become a Christian, do I have to tell people? No. The only person that matters is God. You don't have to tell anybody. Do I have to give up this or give up that or start doing this? No. All you have to do is it matters between you and God. Once they're saved, they're probably going to 
as they read through Scripture, understand it when they could not before, and God the Holy Spirit will work and bring about the changes. But if you try to say, yeah, if you become a Christian, you need to do this, 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 and this, they're going to hear that as a condition for becoming saved. And you're, you're putting the law before the exodus. So those are secondary issues that will be straightened out once a person is regenerate and God the Holy Spirit starts to work on them. And I prefer for him to work on them than me. So God gives us the law in the New Testament. It's the law of Christ. So Paul lays down, and the last thing they have in the lesson is from 1 Corinthians 5. And basically what they're addressing here is that same point I've been making, is that we should develop relationships with unbelievers. We should be cautious. 1 Corinthians 15 says that bad company corrupts good morals. So we have to be cautious. But we should not isolate ourselves. Uh, we should care about the loss. We should build relationships with them. And, um, uh, but there are guidelines. In 1 Corinthians 5, 9, Paul says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. But you have to read the next verse. He said, yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of the world. I mean, they're just going to do what comes naturally because they don't have any divine standards. I, I, I did not mean the sexually immoral people of the world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to get out of the world. But now I've written to you not to keep company with anyone who identifies as a Christian who is, op and this really this is someone who's it's openly sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or reviler or drunkard or an extortioner, don't even eat with such a person. This is a principle of separation because this is a rebellious, carnal individual. And so uh, that there are consequences to that in terms of relationships with believers. And in verse 12, Paul says, For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? In other words, you, you can't impose your Christian values on the unbeliever because they don't know any better. But for the believer, well, that's a different story. All right. That brings us to the end of Lesson 13. And next time we're going to continue because there's three lessons that deal with aspects of the law. And we've just dealt with the first part of them. Anybody have any questions? Yeah. Yeah. So how does that, how does not bearing the blood when they do the sprinkling um, relate to the... Where does he say not to bury the blood? No, no. I, I didn't say that he said that. It's, oh. They're sprinkling it on the people. Yeah. But it says that when you kill the animal, you're supposed to bury the blood. So they're taking the blood and sprinkling it on the people. Yeah. Can I ask kind of a weird question? Yeah. Then, okay. <laughs> Because you're, you're saying, it's, you indicate that somewhere in the scripture it says that they buried the, buried the blood. No, it says you're supposed to bury the blood when you kill the animal, because the life of the animal is in the blood. Well, where does it say that? Genesis something something. Okay, we'll see. We, uh, you know, I, I've done this question and answer live on the radio. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm and I learned good. a long time ago, yeah, you know, I, I, I want to read the verse in context. Okay. That's why I'm saying I'm not giving you a hard time. It's just that I, you know, somebody says, well, you know, somewhere in the Bible it says, and I always say, okay, well, tell me where in the Bible because I need to read it so I can really understand it. Any other questions? All right, let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity to go through this material, get an understanding of the purpose for the law. It's the same as the purpose for the commandments, prohibitions in the New Testament that there's a right way and a wrong way that we should live our lives as part of the family of God. And so, Father, help us to understand these uh, important distinctions and also the as we go forward to understand just what you are doing in relationship to your plan for the uh, Jewish people. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.